what to use the most beautiful or elegant equation in mathematics. I mean, one of the things that people often look to in, in beauty is the simplicity. So if you look at E equals MC squared, mm -hmm. so when, when a few concepts come together, that's why the Euler identity mm -hmm. is often considered uh, the most beautiful equation in mathematics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you do you find beauty in that one in the oil identity? Yeah. Well, as I said, I mean, well, what I find most appealing is, is connections between different things that you. Um, so the if you uh, e to the pi i equals minus one. Um, so yeah, people are, oh, it uses all the fundamental constants. Okay, uh, that that that's I mean that's cute. Um, but but <laughs> to me, so the yeah. exponential function was introduced by Euler to measure exponential growth. You know, so think compound interest or decay or anything which is continuously growing, continuously decreasing, growth and decay or dilation or contraction is modeled by the exponential function. Um, whereas pi uh, comes around from circles and rotation. Right? If you want to rotate a needle, for example, 180 degrees, uh, you need to rotate by pi radians. And I complex numbers, represents this swapping between real and imaginary axes so of a 90 degree rotation, so a change in direction. So the exponential function represents growth and decay in the direction that you already are. Um, when you stick an eye in the exponential, it, it, it now it, it's, it's uh, instead of motion in the same direction as your current position, it's the motion as a right angle as your current position, so rotation. Um, and then so e to, e to the pi equals minus one tells you that if you rotate for time pi, you end up at the other direction. So it unifies geometry through dilation and exponential growth or dynamics through this act of, of complexification, rotation by, by, by eye. So it, it connects together all these fields of mathematics. Yeah. yeah, dynamics, geometry, and complex, and complex, and um, the complex numbers, they're all considered almost, yeah, they're all next door neighbors in mathematics uh, because of this identity. Do, do you think the thing you mentioned is cute, the, 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 the collision of notations from these disparate fields um, is just a frivolous, side effect or do you think there is legitimate like value in um, when the notation all the our old friends come together at, <laughs> and right unite? well it's 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 confirmation that you have the right concepts um so when you first study anything um you you have to measure things and give them names um and initially sometimes you're because your your model is again too far off from reality you give the wrong things the best names and you only find out later what's what's really important. Physicists can do this sometimes. I mean, but it turns out okay. So actually, with physics, okay, so E equals MC squared. Okay, so uh, one of the, the big things was the E, right? So when when Aristotle first came up with his laws of, of motion, and then and then um, Galileo and Newton and so forth, you know, they saw the things they could they could measure. They could measure mass and acceleration and force and so forth. And so Newtonian mechanics, for example, you know, F equals MA was the famous uh, Newton's second law of motion. So those were the, the primary objects. So they gave them the central building in the theory. It was only later, after people started analyzing these equations, that there always seemed to be these quantities that were conserved. Um, so in particular, momentum and energy. Um, uh, and th it's not obvious that things have an energy. Like it's not something you can directly measure the same way you can measure mass and, and, and velocity and so forth. But over time, people realized that this was actually a really fundamental concept. Hamilton, eventually in the 19th century, reformulated Newton's laws of physics into what's called Hamiltonian mechanics, where the energy, which is now called the Hamiltonian, was the dominant object. Once you know how to measure the Hamiltonian of any system, you can describe completely the, the dynamics, like what, what happens to, to, to all the states. Like it's, um, it, it really was a central actor, which was not obvious initially. Um, and this uh, helped actually, uh, this change of perspective really helped when quantum mechanics came along. Uh, because it, um, the early physicists who studied quantum mechanics, they had a lot of trouble trying to adapt their Newtonian thinking because you know, everything was a particle and so forth to, to, to quantum mechanics, you know, because now everything because it was a wave. It, it just looked really, really weird. Um, like you ask, what is the quantum version of F equals MA? And it's really, really hard to, to give an answer to that. Um, but it turns out that the Hamiltonian, which was so um, secretly behind the scenes in classical mechanics, also is the key uh, object in um, um, in quantum mechanics. That there's, there's also an object called the Hamiltonian. It's a different type of object. It's what's called an operator rather than than a function. But um, and um, but again, once you specify it, you specify the entire dynamics. So there's something called Schrodinger's equation that tells you exactly how quantum systems evolve once you have the Hamiltonian. So. Side by side, they look completely different objects. You know, like so one involves particles, one involves waves, and so forth. But with this centrality, you could start actually transferring a lot of intuition and facts from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. So, for example, in, in 
classical mechanics, there's this thing called Noether's theorem. Every time there's a symmetry in a physical system, there is a conservation law. So the laws of physics are translation invariant. Like if I move 10 steps to the left, I experience the same laws of physics as if I was here. And that corresponds to conservation momentum. Um, if I turn around by, by some angle, again, I experience the same laws of physics. Uh, this corresponds to conservation of angular momentum. If I wait for 10 minutes, um, I st still have the same laws of physics. Um, so there's time transition invariance. This corresponds to the law of conservation of energy. Um, so there's this fundamental connection between symmetry and conservation. Um, and that's also true in quantum mechanics, even though the equations are completely different. But because they're both coming from the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian controls everything. Um, every time the Hamiltonian has a symmetry, the equations will, will have a conservation law. Um, so it's, 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 once you have the right language, it actually makes things um, uh, a, lot, a lot cleaner. One of the problems why we can't unify quantum mechanics and general relativity yet, we haven't figured out what the fundamental objects are. Like, for example, we have to give up the notion of space and time being these almost Euclidean type spaces. And it has to be, um, you know, and, you know, we kind of know that uh, at very tiny scales, uh, um, there's going to be quantum fluctuations, there's a space, a space time foam. Um, and trying to, to use Cartesian coordinates XYZ is going to be, it's, it's just, it's, it's a non starter. But we don't know how to, what to replace it with. Um, we don't actually have the mathematical, we, um, um, concepts, yeah, the analog of the Hamiltonian that sort of organized everything.